children laugh and play and learn what's right. I remember those who fought to forge our freedom, and those who'd rather die than lose the fight. But it seems today we take it all for granted, and it's easier to blame. Think about the future of this nation. I wonder if the torch will still burn bright, and if each new generation will remember and defend her honor then with all her might. For I believe that the faith of our fathers is the cornerstone that made our nation great and we will stand for centuries if we remain upon our knees i still believe our faith it's not too late i still believe we're the last hope of liberty the promise of the land I love, and I'm not ashamed to say, I pledge allegiance still today, I still believe in America, I still believe in America, America. All right, good. Thank you very much. Well, that, that was very good. Take your Bible, please, and go, if you will, back to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 2. Look at verses 3, 4, and 5 again. The Bible says, He said unto me, the Son of Man, I send thee to the children of Israel, a rebellious house that hath rebelled against me, and their fathers have transgressed against me, even until, or even, it says, until this, or even unto this very day. The Bible says, For their uh, impotent children, stiff necked, I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. Now look down in verse 5. The Bible says, And they, uh, whether they hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. I pray for the day that here in America, as men of God will rise up and will become prophets in their own nation uh, so that our nation can once again be turned back to the Lord in a greater capacity. You know, as I was coming up as a young man, I, uh, I, I lived at uh, uh, 4807 Maple Grove Road in Hampstead, Maryland. I was uh, curious uh, last night, so I got on the Google Maps <clears throat> to be able to look at the old homestead at uh, 4807 Maple Grove Road. And uh, boy, it's changed. I mean, they've, uh, they've reduced the house and now it's gone from a two-car garage to a one-car garage. All the land that we used to uh, own all to the left of us and back into the deep meadows uh, has been partitioned off, especially up in the front part of the property and sold out and stuff like that. And things have changed. America has changed. We see so many things that are taking place in America. 
I, I wish we could go back a couple of years. I remember coming up as a young man. If uh, you were to visit me uh, at my house there uh, on Maple Grove Road, uh, you would find out on Sunday I would not be there. I'd be working a bus route every Sunday morning. And then on Sunday night, I'd be in church uh, as a teenager listening to my preacher preach. On Monday, you would find out that if you came to my house, I'd be either out riding motorcycles through the uh, cornfields, or I'd be over at Wade Wagner's place, and we'd be riding horses together, or I'd, I'd be uh, uh, maybe playing basketball with some of the people that would come over our house as we had a basketball court uh, in the front of our house. But on Monday, uh, it was our free time uh, to be able to do what we wanted to do. On Tuesday, it was always home time. Uh, Mama expected everybody to be home, and that was the time when we came home directly from school, and we worked in the garden, and we pulled all those nasty weeds, and we worked down into the fields if need be, uh, whether it would be running a tractor, or whether it would be running a disc, or whether it would be planting, or whether it would be uh, starting the harvest time, or whatever the case may be. On Wednesday night, you'd always find me at my church that I attended now as a saved boy, and uh, in the Bible study hour. And then on Thursday, uh, uh, the pastor had a, a gathering time where they, they called it visitation, and I'd go out on visitation with my pastor and spent time with my pastor and, and those that came out. Friday night, you'd find me at the River Valley Ranch. River Valley Ranch played a big part, Millers, Maryland, in my life. And uh, you'd find me there every Friday night, almost without exception. I'd be at the River Valley Ranch on Friday night. And uh, they always had youth speakers over the summertime. That was my favorite time. And so uh, they opened it up to the public. And so on Friday night, you didn't have to be a camper. Uh, they didn't just exclusively keep it closed to the campers. They opened it up to the community. Many families would come on Friday night uh, to be able to hear the preachers in the evening services. And so I'd be up there almost every Friday night without fail uh, to hear some preacher that would preach the Bible as a teenager. Then on Saturday night, they always had movie night. It was a Christian movie that they would show. They, I remember seeing Sheffy several times and uh, uh, the printing and uh, different ones that was new productions back then. And uh, watching these movies that they would have. It was called uh, Christian Movie Night at River Valley Ranch. And people throughout the community would come. And uh, they would watch these Christian films uh, on uh, Saturday evening. And I'd be one of those that would come in on Saturday evening. Uh, the 4th of July around our house was always a spectacular event. Uh, my dear mother loved to cook, and, uh, and so my mom would, uh, was always hot, hot dogs and hamburgers and french fries on the 4th of July. And uh, then we'd find fireworks to go see somewhere at night, and we always spent time. Uh, we set up a big old volleyball net in the back of the house, and, and uh, we'd have uh, different ones that would come from uh, different places. I had relatives that lived in Pennsylvania, relatives that lived in uh, Baltimore City, and they'd come up to the countryside where we lived, and we'd have a big old volleyball net uh, outside, and we'd have volleyball, and uh, then we'd go back and eat more hot dogs and play more volleyball, then we'd eat more hot dogs and play more volleyball, and uh, just a and watermelon watermelon and how can you eat watermelon without salt and uh, and so uh, we had salted watermelon and we'd enjoy that time of that freedom now can I tell you I thank God that we have America and I thank God that we have the freedoms that we do have you know on the day that the colonies came together to be able uh, to become independent of that which is England uh, there was the words of freedom that was written, and a part of those words, the Declaration of Independence, started like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain uh, unalienable uh, rights. It says that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At the end of the Declaration of Independence, there was a man that first signed, his name was John Hancock. John Hancock, Hancock was the very first one to sign the Declaration of Independence, and as he signed it, he signed it very big. Matter of fact, uh, he was the, the largest signature on that particular document. Uh, people even say today, uh, uh, go ahead and put your John Hancock there. You know, that's a saying. Uh, just go ahead and put your John Hancock there because he had the largest signature. And by the way, you don't remember the second one that signed, do you? His name was uh, Josiah Bartlett. Josiah Bartlett. But nobody remembers that guy. 
But they remember uh, the John Hancock. They remember that he signed that Declaration of Independence. But few people understand what took place after that. Uh, there was great celebration on the 4th, the 5th, and the 6th. Great celebration. I mean, now we have decided to break from England. Now we've decided that we're going to be an independent nation. And uh, it was a great celebration, but there was much travail to come after that. It was in December of 1776 that George Washington now had a very nimble type of army. That uh, army that he had was disintegrating before his very eyes. The army had become very weak. The army that he took against uh, New York was tremendously wiped out almost in completion, and he was left with just a remnant of men that was left. He knew that uh, come the 31st, that a lot of men uh, that was enlisted was going to go home because on the 31st, all the men uh, had a choice to either re-sign up or go home. Uh, by that time also, these men that were so very discouraged, some of them decided that they would run and just flee, and so they decided they would leave anyway. Congress had already fled uh, Philadelphia uh, because they felt like they were losing their city, and so they fled. The gunpowder was small. The food was small, the other supplies was small, the morale was small. The citizens uh, that had celebrated the 4th, 5th, and 6th were now wondering what was the point of celebrating. Looks like we're going to lose it all. Uh, most of the soldiers uh, that were finishing up their enlistment had already echoed throughout the colonies that they were not going to re-enlist. George Washington had these uh, uh, men uh, that was beside him, and he decided that he was going to try to attack and to take over uh, the elite squad that was called the Haitians, and he was going to go after them. It was going to take crossing the Delaware River. As they were getting ready to cross the Delaware River that night, there was hail, there was sleet, uh, there was uh, a tremendous amount of ice that they had to cut through. It looked like the operation was not going to be successful at all. He had two other generals at that time that even failed to be able to follow him as he executed his determinate plan to be able to overtake the Haitians. Uh, Washington led these group, this, this group, these troops, if you will, uh, on a nine-mile walk. They almost felt like that they were defeated. They were certainly ill-equipped. The ones that they're about to fight were elite trained men. These were not the normal men, but these were elite status men, well equipped and well prepared. They said that Washington often would kneel before going into battle, and he would kneel and he would pray. So did he do on that day as well. He knelt and he prayed, and something took place in the heart of those men when they saw Washington kneel and pray that they said sent goosebumps all over them because they knew that when he rose up and the smile that he had on his face, that victory was at hand. When he rose up and he went against those elite soldiers, he told the men that after the battle that we win, we'll celebrate. And when they did, and because of that, we have that which is freedom today. It was the battle that was conducted on December the 25th, 1776. And they said, what a day to win on the day that we celebrate the birth of our Christ. Now, can I tell you, there's many battles that's been fought over the years. There's many different wars that's been waged over the years. But you and I can be inspired by those that have gone forward. We can be inspired by those that have kept the faith. We can be inspired by those that were inspired to trust God. Let me speak to you for just a few minutes on inspired to trust God. How is it that you and I in our present day could be inspired to trust God? Let's go back a little bit further. Let's talk about uh, Ezekiel. As we read in uh, the scriptures just a moment ago, as you read in the scriptures that here Ezekiel is facing a rebellious nation. They've rebelled, the Bible says, uh, against God. And to this very day, they're still rebelling. In verse 4 of Ezekiel chapter 2, you see that these are impotent children that are stiff-necked. And uh, they are not wanting to do anything that has to do with God. You see that uh, God speaks to Ezekiel's heart and says to Ezekiel, I want you to go down and I want you to preach to these people. Now be minded, God says, that these are a people of a rebellious 
house. These are people that are stiff-necked. These are people that's already uh, standing up against God. And you be mindful of that as you go down to you preach uh, to these people. But uh, he says there needs to be a prophet among them. I believe this. I believe as the pulpits in America, so are the churches. As the churches in America, so many times are the influences into the homes, yea, into the communities. And so it's very important that those things be uttered that are true from pulpits around America. Understand where Ezekiel is. Ezekiel now is being sent to those that's been in exile uh, for that which is 70 years. They've been imprisoned. They've been tossed into the opposing country's land. Uh, they're in stocks and they're in bonds or they're servants, if you will. Uh, they Now, many of them have turned even to other gods because they're so discouraged and the consequences of that is weighing heavy now on Israel. Uh, they're running with false prophets. Uh, they're attending all sorts of false hopes. But yet, Ezekiel takes up that which is the commission that's given to him by God to be able to go and to preach to such a people. As he preaches to such a people, uh, as it was in George Washington's day, where the future of America was going to rest on his shoulders, the freedom of Israel was going to rest on the soldiers of, uh, on the, on the shoulders of Israel. Ezekiel. Uh, here was a faithful man. Here was a man that provided his best, whether they would listen or whether they would not listen. But for uh, that time, he was supposed to preach to them. And you, you say, well, what happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, Seventy years later, 70 years later, uh, all of a sudden now, you see that this people decide to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the city. Now, just because somebody hears the truth today doesn't mean they obey the truth today, but if you never plant the seed, the crop never comes in. You have to plant the seed. Can I tell you uh, that uh, somebody uh, ought to stand up uh, in uh, different phases of society and start simply uh, planting the seed. Now, that doesn't mean that things are going to change overnight. But what it does mean is that the seed now that is planted might be able to bear fruit later on. A Bible says to train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart from it. That doesn't mean if you train your child today that they'll obey tomorrow. Uh, it means this, that when they become old, all of a sudden they wake up and say, oh, that's what mama taught. All of a sudden they wake up and they say, oh, that's what grandma taught. All of a sudden they wake up and say, oh, that's what daddy taught. All of a sudden they wake up and say, that's what grandpa taught. You see, uh, don't get discouraged all of a sudden when you plant the seed and you don't see the fruit of it immediately because it takes a while for fruit to be able to develop. It takes a while for the crop to come in. But uh, my responsibility as a husband, my responsibility as a daddy, my responsibility as a preacher, my responsibility as a Christian leader is to make sure that I'm planting the right seed. If I plant the right seed, then I'm going to have a right crop that comes in later. But if I don't plant the right seed, there'll be no crop. You know, some people don't wake up until they're older, but they remember what mama said. They remember what daddy said. You know, some people who live in misery all the days of their life and they're sad and they're just uh, uh, set aside and they're not uh, obeying God and they're having a difficult time uh, in their life. But if you plant the right seed, can I tell you, uh, as a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Well, I remember the days of coming up uh, in Maryland as I also worked in the farm over in Miller's, Maryland. And as uh, uh, I was in charge of the planting and I was in charge of the harvesting and stuff like that as Paul had died early on. And I remember running the equipment and running the tractors and disking the land and planting and doing all those many things. And I remember doing that uh, as a young teenage boy. And can I tell you, uh, I, I, I did not understand uh, how God uh, worked. But oh, it was so wonderful to be able to go out in the fields and see the corn. It was so wonderful to go out in the fields and see the wheat. It was so wonderful to go out in the fields and see uh, the different types of crops that we planted. And it was ready for harvest time to bring in that which is the fruit of our labor. And can I tell you, listen, uh, don't be discouraged and don't be dismayed. All of a sudden, when you hear that America is doing some things that's not scriptural and uh, doing some things that's not right. Don't let that give you poochie disease 
listen, don't let yourself get down and get discouraged. Why? Because as America was once great, America can be great again, but we need people that's going to rise up and people that's going to plant the right type of seed. And if you'll do that in your home, you do that in your community, you do that in your business, you do that in your uh, neighborhood, you do that in your city, you do that in your county, you do that in your state, you'll be surprised how God could use that because as one comes together with another and another and another and another, America certainly can be a country that is great under God again. I'm saying this. I'm saying that there's the prophet Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel went and he did, by the way, saw very little results. But 70 years later, 70 years later, Jerusalem is now being rebuilt. 70 years later, something, some, something caught in the heart of a child. Something caught in the heart of a teenager. See, see, you understand, but uh, we have young people here today that's going to be a part of the legislative program of tomorrow. They'll be legislators. We have young people sitting in here today that might be the mayors uh, of uh, your cities tomorrow. We have young people sitting here that's going to be the doctors, that's going to be the lawyers, that's going to own companies, that's going to be in areas of having great influence and the ability to be able to use what God has given them. But uh, they need to know the direction in which to go. And so if you get discouraged and you uh, become somebody that says, well, I'll tell you what, uh, America is going to hell in a handbasket, so we might as well just throw it in. We might as well just give up. I'm so discouraged about that might as well just get rid of it all then they have no hope you are the hope of those that are sitting we got a youth conference coming up we have 250 or so I guess teenagers that'll be here and can I tell you these teenagers that's going to come from different states and uh, Mexico and other places that's going to be here can I tell you that uh, they need to be able to leave here and have some hope that they can go back home and be able to put God in the midst of their problems and in their churches and, and go out and rise up and do something and get the education and be something for God. I'm saying this. I'm saying that here's the prophet of Ezekiel. By looking at his life, you get to be encouraged. How about the precious Savior? The precious Savior. Uh, look at uh, uh, Mark chapter 6 and verse 6. The Bible says he marveled because of their unbelief. Now here he's coming back to the villages to teach. The villages that he once lived in. The villages where he grew up. And nobody receives the Lord. Rejected. Can you imagine how he felt? Mark chapter 6 and verse 7, the Bible says, And he called unto his uh, twelve, and he began to send them forth uh, two and two, and he gave them power over unclean spirits. So he says to these disciples around him, You go ahead and go. And he sends them out. The Bible says in verse 8, the Bible says he commanded them that they should uh, uh, take, it says, nothing for their journey. Save a staff only, it says, uh, and no script and no uh, bread and no money for their purse. That's different than when I travel. Boy, I'll fly out somewhere to preach, and boy, I'll tell you, I, I'm taking walking shoes, though I may not walk. I'm, I'm taking dress shoes for preaching in church. I'm taking a T-shirt. I'm taking a button-up dress shirt. I'm taking ties. I'm taking dress pants. Uh, I, I'll take some breaker uh, 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 sweat type of things in case I decide to go. I'll take some sleeping wear pajamas. I mean, I'll, pay, I'll make sure my toothpaste is packed and my toothbrush is packed and my razor is packed. And I'll, I'll make sure that I've got the documents I need, the maps I need, the hotel reservations that I need, the flight itinerary that I need, the rental car information that I need. I mean, I'll make sure I got it all tucked away. And, and when I walk out there, I'm fully confident I've got it. I know what sermons I'm preaching on Monday night. I know what sermons I'm preaching on Tuesday night. I know how I'm speaking to the staff. I'm speaking to them on a Tuesday morning. I mean, I've got everything in tow, and I'm ready to go. But here the Lord says to these that are disciples, hey, he said, now save, uh, it says, a staff only. He said, no script, no bread, no money for their purse. Uh, the Bible says in verse 9 of Mark 6, he says, uh, uh, be shod with sandals, and it says, 
uh, but uh, it says, uh, uh, but not more, if you will, or it says, and to put, it says, on two coats. And so they're taking two coats there. And it says, now, now listen, when you enter into a house, he said you're supposed to abide there until it's time to leave. So in other words, don't get mad at people if you're not treated right. If they serve you something to eat and you don't like it, eat it anyway. Be thankful for what you got. Don't be in a hurry. All right. Uh, in verse 11, he says this, and whatsoever it says shall not receive you, he says, or, or, nor hear you. He says, when you depart thence, he says, uh, uh, shake, it says, the dust off of your feet for the testimony against them. He says, now, you know, don't, don't do anything else, but when you leave, you know, just shake it off. Just shake it off. Just shake it off. In other words, uh, all of a sudden you're going up there and you're, you're telling somebody how to be saved or you're preaching the Bible and he says they're not listening to you. Don't get upset about it. Don't take it personal. Just shake it off. Now, that is what our precious Savior is telling them. Now, can I tell you, that's the way we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be, well, I tell you what, you preach the Bible, you help somebody, you show them the Bible. Well, what do you do? You do the best you can. Now, don't take it personal. All of a sudden, somebody doesn't listen. Here's what you do. Uh, don't get mad at them. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. Look, I disagree with the Pentagon uh, saying that uh, it's okay for transgenders uh, now to be recognized in their military and dress according to their belief, of their, their belief, their belief, their belief, their belief of their gender. I disagree with that. Amen. That's against scripture. I disagree with that. I disagree with the uh, uh, California Senate that came out just uh, yesterday and said that for colleges that are Christian colleges in the state of California now, you have to allow transgenders in. I disagree with that. I'll fight it tooth and nail. I disagree with it. But listen, uh, I realize this. I realize that uh, you and I uh, have to let, you, you can't just passively sit by. You, you've got to contact people that have the power to make different changes. And you've got to pray. And you've got to become involved. Uh, you can't uh, be somebody that just passively sits by and let the nation go to pot. You cannot be that way. You've got to be somebody that uh, uh, knows the precious Savior. He is worth exalting. He is worth pointing people to. And by the way, can I tell you, what's going to change a nation is the fact of people getting saved. Amen. You know, when people receive Jesus Christ as Savior, the Holy Ghost comes to abide. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, they go to do something, and if they're, if they're saved, they get under conviction about it. You ever, you ever do that as a believer? You ever do that? You ever do that as a believer? All of a sudden, you go to do something because you're a believer. It's almost like my daddy used to say, others may, you cannot... Others may, you cannot. He, used to, he said, you're a wells. Others may, you cannot. There are certain things wells don't do. Others may, you cannot. Boy, I carried that over into my household. I thought, that's a pretty good saying. <laughs> now, now, may I say this? As a believer, others may, but you cannot. You protect your testimony. Because, watch this, in so doing, you're representing someone. You're representing someone. So as you represent him, realize how precious he is. Look, 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 look. I am saved. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. If I take my last breath while standing here behind this pulpit, which I hope I don't, my next breath will be in heaven. Saved. Now, because I'm saved, I want to live for him. Because I'm saved, I want to honor him. Because I'm saved, I want to tell everybody about him. Because I'm saved, I want to shout it from the housetops and shout it from the mountaintops. And I want to do my best to make sure that somebody understands that Jesus Christ is the one that saves. So how is it that a person can be encouraged to trust God? Well, look at the prophet Ezekiel. Look at the precious Savior. Let me give you one last one. And look at the, uh, the uh, passionate Paul. Passionate Paul. You know, uh, Paul had a lot of things on him. But Paul was very passionate about the things he did. Let me read it to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. The Bible says, unless I should be exalted above measure. He says, through the abundance of the revelations. Uh, God entrusted him. And God gave him uh, books to be able to pen for you here today. The Bible says there was given to me, it says, a thorn in the flesh. It says, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. He's losing his eyesight. 
Uh, he was writing to the Corinthian church at one time, and he had to write in big, large letters because he was losing his eyesight. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 8, the Bible says, for this thing, it says, I besought the Lord thrice. It says, then it might depart from me. So he came to the Lord and said, Lord, take it away, take it away, take it away. Don't you understand who I, take it away, take it away, take it away. God, I was used to you to pin the book. God, take it away, take it away, take it away. I planted so many church, take it away, take it away, take it away. And God said, no. See, not always does God answer prayer when you want or with what you do want. All right? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, the Bible says, and he said unto me, he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly. Therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities. It says that the power of Christ might rest upon me. God said, no, I'm not going to take it away. And Paul had to come back and say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rest in God. Listen to it in verse 10. The Bible says, therefore, it says, I take pleasure in my infirmities. I take pleasure. God, I'm going blind, but I take pleasure in that. God, I'm in a wheelchair, but I take pleasure in that. God, I can't hear, but I take pleasure in that. God, I, I'm losing my memory, but I'm taking pleasure in that. God, I tell you what, I, I'm just not getting around like I used to physically, but I take pleasure in that. Paul said this, he said, therefore, he says, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. The Bible says, for when I am weak, he says, then am I strong. Now, why? Because he's relying on someone. All right, Brother Craig, come help me. And so here's a picture of the Lord, and so here's Paul. You know, Paul said, uh, come stand beside me, we'll walk together. And so Paul said this. He said, look, he said, when I'm weak, he said, I'm relying on Christ. And Christ will simply hold me up. He said, when I'm walking along, and all of a sudden I find myself weak, I rely on Christ. Walking along, just having a hard time, rely on Christ. Walk along, just difficult. All right? You rely on him. See, here's what we want to do. And this is why we got a nation that's in a mess. Because every man does that which is right in his own eyes. And they're living a life like there is no God. I was over at a restaurant. Thank you. See, I was over at a restaurant not too long ago. And I was walking out of the restaurant. And I saw two girls, college-age girls. And they were sitting there in the restaurant with Bibles open. Now, by the way, this is after a Sunday morning. And Bibles open. And so I stopped, and I said, hey, I want to come in you. You got your Bibles open. That's great. They said, yeah, we went to church, and we just couldn't get enough. Hello. Said we wanted more. Couldn't get enough. All right, now, wait a minute. Listen, you know, that was a testimony for all that walked by as they saw these two young ladies with their Bibles open. I'm saying this this morning. I'm saying that uh, Paul was very passionate. The Apostle Paul uh, was now uh, preaching here to the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth had arguments and strife inside of the church. The church at Corinth was in one of the most uh, wicked cities of that day as far as sin is concerned that was recorded in uh, human history. The church at Corinth was fussing and fractions among them, immorality and lawsuits and false doctrine and false teachers, but yet uh, that did not take Paul out. And Paul said, well, you know, I can't preach to them because look at them, they're a mess. No, that's why he needed to preach to them. Yes. See, uh, uh, Paul struggled with his past. Can you imagine Paul? Can you imagine? Can you imagine Paul? He was known as Saul walking down the Damascus road. He had already attacked the church so many times. And uh, he, he didn't want nothing to do with God. He would, what he would do is he would, he would stand up while the preacher was preaching, and he would heckle. Right. He would heckle in the back, heckle. And then, uh, you know, and then what would happen is he would write the names of people that was in the church service that were outstanding leaders in the city, people of means. He would follow them home, give false accusations against them, so that they could be brought to court. And then he would stand up as a witness against them to make sure that they were thrown into prison and certainly at some being put to death. He did that. Yeah. Then all of a sudden he gets saved. All of a sudden God changes his life. Yeah. They say that Paul could master five different languages. Master five different languages. They said that he was highly educated above the measure of the common man of that day. 
And so now he's called to preach and he stands up before the Sanhedrin and he stands up before the Pharisees and the Sadducees and uh, the Jewish sect of the seed of Abraham and he proclaims the word of God and he teaches in many languages and he preaches the word of God and yet now he comes to this church and no doubt he looks at this church and, and maybe through some frustration thinking the cost that he's paid. Why should I be sent to such a church to help? But he was and he did. And because of that, you have good doctrine that you'd see throughout your Bible because of the things that he learned. But the Bible says that he had a thorn in the flesh. And that thorn in the flesh was that he was going blind. He was going blind. Hershenhine was the man's name that was at Central Baptist Church in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Brother Hershenhine. Brother Hershenhine was in his 80s. And one day somebody came to Brother Hershenhein and said, uh, Brother Hershenhein, why is it that you come to church? You cannot see, you cannot hear. He said, but every person in this church need to see uh, whose side I'm on, and it's not the devil. Amen. See, you have an influence. Uh, no matter, come on. I, we had a good soul winning crowd out here yesterday. Uh, we have a, a lot of, of different soul winning times, a lot of different soul winning times. Uh, we have a, a Thursday morning, uh, 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 what they call the Joy Club for ladies. And, oh, I don't know, we have uh, eight or ten ladies that come out to the Joy Club on Thursday mornings. Thursday night, we have teen soul winning, 6.30. Then adult soul winning on Thursday night at uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, then uh, on Saturday, we have a soul winning rally where uh, these three sections here will fill uh, up with the different people. And, and uh, we get ready to go soul winning. Then we dismiss out. We have Spanish soul winning down in one of the rooms where they meet and now we have another program called the Rose uh, Soul Winning Program for Ladies. Another lady soul winning program on, on Saturday morning and uh, at uh, 1030 that meets. And then uh, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, Sunday afternoon, we have a men's soul winning time. And then we have RU, Reformers Unanimous. And then we run buses that go everywhere picking up people. And then we support missionaries. And then uh, we have uh, nursing home ministries that we now do. We're on Saturdays at 5 o'clock. There's the nursing home ministries. And we started a brand new ministry under Brother Walters called the America for Christ that meets at 2 o'clock on Saturday afternoon and goes to 5 o'clock. And, and then we support missionaries around the world. You see, when you come to Parkside Baptist Church, you just kind of believe that we believe the gospel enough to get it out. Now, I'm saying this. I'm saying that uh, as we get out the gospel, uh, there's opportunities to be able uh, to share that gospel with somebody else. And, and that's what Paul was trying to do. He was trying to get out that gospel to people. But yet, uh, the people that was in that church, uh, there was fussing and fighting and pulling on each other and lawsuits and all sorts of problems inside of the church. And yet, Paul, very old man now, losing his sight, but he just kept going. Amen. He just kept going. And can I tell you that we can be encouraged by Ezekiel. Yes. That was used of God and yet 70 years later, God delivered the nation back to the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Amen. We can be encouraged by that. Yes. You plant your seed today and watch it grow tomorrow. You can be encouraged by that. Wait a minute, you can be encouraged by the precious Savior that wasn't even welcome in his own villages, uh, but yet sent him out two by two, and during the time of the apostles turned the world upside down. You can be encouraged by that. You can be encouraged by old Paul that was going blind, that came from the other side of the tracks, and losing his sight, and had all these afflictions and all these problems, but yet as he laid on his bed and he remembered where God had brought him from to where God had taken him to, no doubt others saw it too, and was greatly encouraged by that which is the passion of a Paul. He said, oh, preacher, I'll tell you what today. Oh, by the way, uh, you so, uh, give me another example. Well, don't forget George Washington. Amen. Amen. Don't forget how our nation became independent of Britain. Amen. But it was because on the December 25th of the ninth, or it was 1776 that that uh, 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 colonel uh, marched, if you will, please, uh, that he marched across, that general, if you will, marched across uh, nine miles and leading those men, and all the other ones had turned back, took that uh, other colony of the Brits by surprise, and there delivered our freedom. 
Boy, God is certainly good, isn't he? Father, bless we pray.